In the years 340 to 338 BC, Rome would take a major step in its conquest over the Italian peninsula. Though, as you might imagine, it was not something that would come to be without some fierce resistance, particularly from that of the Latin League. Now, Rome and the Latin League had since been allies, at least since the First Latin War, a hundred years earlier, in 498 BC to 493 BC, where a peace treaty was signed between the two sides that saw them operate within the Italian realm as equals. Whilst the two sides weren't besties, they did live peacefully alongside each other and even adopted each other's enemies so as to maintain said peace. Other times they would call upon each other to assist in battles and would even share the spoils of joint campaigns. Despite having once been enemies, the Latins and Romans had at least coexisted for this duration of history and shared a mutual respect and understanding for one another that saw both territories grow. The Latin League, unlike Rome, did not have a central government, but were instead multiple towns and cities that shared language, culture and law. These towns and cities that were dotted around the Italian peninsula were self-governing states, but as you might imagine, the separation of each state made them vulnerable to attacks from the neighboring and notorious tribes of the Equae and the Volsci. So having formed an alliance with Rome, known as the Treaty of Cassius, the two sides were now in a much more formidable position to defend against these reoccurring raids, and both benefited from the added layer of protection. But because Rome was so much larger than the Latin-led cities, it naturally assumed a more dominant role in the alliance, with its growing numbers and hearty appetite for conquest. It got to the point that the Latins were no longer so concerned with the Equae and Volsci attacks, but were instead more apprehensive over the juggernaut that Rome was becoming. Pretty soon, the chasm-like difference between the two sides became increasingly obvious, especially with Rome taking liberties with their alliance and not really respecting the original basis of their treaty. The Latin League grew weary with this mistreatment and soon expressed that they were dissatisfied with the way the Romans were conducting themselves and believed that they had been relegated to become the subjects of Rome instead of their allies. Feeling undervalued, underappreciated, and probably nervous over the possibility of being absorbed by the beast that was Rome, the Latin League began to entertain the idea of breaking free from their treaty and turning against Rome, even if this meant joining forces with their previous adversaries, the Volsci. The Latin War appears to have overlapped the First Samnite War, which we discussed in the last episode of Ancient Roman History Explained. The Samnite people were a tribal federation living in the central Apennines, who also had a treaty with Rome. But after the Samnites had invaded the region of Campania, most notably the city of Capua, that some might say Rome secretly wanted for itself, for its fertile lands, the Romans turned on the Samnites in an effort to save Campania. It should also be noted that Campania had surrendered to Rome and had pretty much begged them to help them in fending off the Samnites. So Rome went to war with the Samnites, evidently none too perturbed in trading blows with their former allies and something that the Latins would have likely recognized and took note of. The war ended in the year 341 with Roman victory, and yet another peace treaty was enacted between Rome and the Samnites, which saw Rome maintain dominance in Campania, ensuring that no further Samnite attacks would plague its doorstep. Of course, with Campania off limits for the Samnites, the Samnites would rear their heads at an old enemy to conquer instead, those being the old Italic people and neighbours of the Samnites, 
the Sidicini. As discussed in the last episode, it was the Sidicini who had first been attacked by the Samnites, and it was the Sidicini who went to Campania to ask for assistance in fending them off. When Campania agreed, they soon realised they had bitten off more than they could chew, and after losing Capua to the Samnites, it prompted them to go to Rome and beg for aid, which of course led to them surrendering their entire capital to Rome, who would not otherwise help. Seeing Rome as a beacon of light and rescue, the Sidicini also approached Rome during this time, and asked them to help prevent the Samnites from destroying them any further. The Sidicini had pretty good reason to believe Rome would help them, for not only did Rome have a new treaty with the Samnites, and in effect, some authority over them, having already bested them in battle, but they were also in the mind to frame themselves as a noble and heroic nation, a nation that stood up for the little guy. But we also know that this was all a front, and that Rome hid behind this facade so as to justify wars that would result in its continued growth. Wars that did not contribute to this growth were therefore not in Rome's best interests, and were probably quickly dismissed by the Senate. With this, the Sidicini, who had no benefit to Rome, were told that their plea for help had come too late, and that if they wanted help, they should have come to them first, instead of going to Campania. In essence, Rome left the Sidicini to face their inevitable extinction at the hands of the Samnites. But the Sidicini were not about to go down without a fight, nor without attempting to rope someone else in to defend them. Naturally, with Rome out of the question, the next viable option for them would be none other than the Latins. Now, the Latin League appear to have their own quarrel with the Samnites anyway, and so they didn't need much convincing to go to war with them. But interestingly, there also appear to have been some residual bad blood between the Campani and the Samnites, because they too wanted a piece of the pie, and joined the war as well. The congregation of the Sidicini and the Campani were led by the Latins, and this huge army flooded the Samnite home of Samnium, much to the apparent ignorance of Rome. The details of the confrontation here are sketchy, but it is understood that the Latin-led army were more interested in raiding than actual fighting, and so, even though they had the Samnites outnumbered, and were in a certain position to deal them a deathly blow, they did not conquer the region, nor set up any measures to claim the enemy territory. This may have been because the territory was not worth having, or because this excursion was less political and more of an exacting of a grudge that all three components of the assembled army possessed. The Latins, the Sidicini, and the Campani all had their reasons for detesting the Samnites, and so this large-scale assault could very well have been conducted to seek compensation for their previous losses. Yet another reason why no base head was established in Samnium was probably because all three participants of this battle knew it was only a matter of time before Rome found out what they had done, and because Rome now had a treaty with Samnium, it would only be a matter of time before they trekked their way over and reclaimed it anyway. Like clockwork, the Samnites sent envoys to Rome to complain that they had not been protected from these assaults, and worse yet, two of the offenders, the Latins and the Campani, were supposed to be under Roman influence. The implication made here was that Rome didn't really have that much control at all, and that its allies, whilst docile in a political sense, were more than willing to shun Rome's supposed authority and do what they wanted anyway. Naturally, this put the Roman Senate in a difficult position, because they needed to be seen to reprimand the Latin League and the Campani for their blatant breaches of their treaties. Yet, they also understood 
that if they were to step in and chastise the Latin League, the Latins would respond adversarially. They had, after all, already gone against Rome by attacking Samnium in the first place, so it was already blatantly obvious that any control Rome had over these people had now expired. With this, Rome was said to give the Samnites an ambiguous response, neither condoning the actions of the Latins, but not exactly promising to stop them either. Whilst Campania could get its wings clipped on the account that they'd already surrendered to Rome and had to do what Rome told it to, the Latin League were, in spite of their now paper-thin treaty, free to do as they pleased. With the ambiguity of Rome's response to the Samnites, it actually weakened their position, at least in the eyes of the Campani, who now saw more strength in the Latin League than in their former saviours of Rome. In a way, I suppose this would make sense, given that there may have been some bad blood between Campania and Rome, given that Rome only offered to help once they had surrendered to them. With this new development, the Campani may have championed the Latins instead, in hopes of re-attaining their independence. Continuing to behave themselves as Roman subjects, it is believed that the Campani were actually secretly plotting with the Latin League for an all-out war against Rome. But like most heavily guarded secrets, someone went and spilled the beans. With this, new consuls were quickly elected early, in an effort to begin their term to prepare for the imminent betrayal of the Campani and the full force of the disgruntled Latin League. These new consuls were Titus Manlius Torquatus and Publius Decius Mus. Roman historian Livy tells us that after the companions were discovered to have had secret talks with the Latins, the Romans sent for ten authoritative figures amongst the Latins to come and discuss matters pertaining to the Samnites. However, these talks were actually to discuss their betrayal. The Latins, however, were aware of what the real nature of these talks would be, and so they came up with convincing enough answers to the questions that the Romans were likely to have asked them before attending the meeting. The Latins sent two officials, or praetors, Lucius Annius of Setia and Lucius Numicius of Circe, to the Roman council, where they nimbly navigated their way through political questioning and accusation. However, this did not stop the Latin praetors from expressing their frustrations over Rome treating them less like allies and more like subjects. With this, they proposed that from now on, one of the two Roman consuls should be of Latin origin and should represent Latin interests so as to ensure an equal share in government affairs. Realizing that the Latin League were not messing around, and wishing to avoid conflict with them, Rome conceded and Lucius Annius was appointed to be the representative of the Latins in the Roman Senate. Along with this meeting, Rome had some conditions of their own that they wished for the Latins to acquiesce to, and the main one was to withdraw their units from Samnium and to leave the Samnites alone. With this, Rome would not only seize tensions in this region, but it would also uphold its treaty with Samnium, in ensuring that as one of its territories, it would be protected. But according to Livy, these conversations were far from peaceful, and in one instance, Lucius Annius was berated by the Roman consul Titus Manlius Torquatus for his disrespecting of the Roman gods. We are told by Livy that after the gods had been invoked by the senators to bless the treaty between Rome and the Latins, Lucius Annius scoffed at the notion and was overheard snickering at the power and relevance of the Roman god Jupiter. After having been furiously chastised by Titus Manlius Torquatus, Lucius Annius stormed out of the Roman assembly, where he slipped on the stairs and fell 
after his death. But seeing this as a sign from the gods, Torquatus believed that Jupiter had shown them a message, that just as he had struck down the Latin envoy, so should Rome strike down the Latin League. In the first recorded battle of this Latin war, known as the Battle of Veseres, or the Battle of Vesuvius, we see the Romans finally fulfill their end of the treaty to Samnium, as they side with the Samnites to take on a coalition of the Latin League, Campania, the Sidicini, and the Volsci tribes, who had once plagued both Latin and Rome, but seemingly decided it hated Rome a little bit more. The battle was fought in the year 340 BC, near Mount Vesuvius, which is located on the Gulf of Naples. Most of the information from this battle comes from Livy, who tells us that both armies arrived near what was once the Veseres River, and were preparing here for battle. However, before the battle could take place, the consul Titus Manlius Torquatus had ordered the army that absolutely no man was to leave his post to fight the enemy, unless he was instructed to do so. But despite this pretty clear order, Torquatus' son led a patrol into Latin controlled territory, where he came across a warrior named Geminus Macius, who was fighting for the Latin League. Little is known about this warrior in particular, but Livy seems to suggest that he was a famous warrior who had much in the way of local notoriety and something of a reputation. Geminus Macius then challenged Torquatus' son to single combat, where Torquatus actually won the battle. Triumphant, he returned back to the camp full of pride and honour, at having slain a notable enemy and having won the respect of his peers. But when his father saw him emerge, he arrested him and publicly executed him via beheading, for not having obeyed his original command of not engaging the enemy. Whilst this was a shocking development, and probably had negative effects for morale, it sure did drive home the point of obeying Torquatus' commands, for if he was willing to behead his own son for such a misfeasance, one could only imagine what he would do to anyone else. Another interesting account from this battle is that both consuls Decius Mus and Manlius Torquatus both had a dream that night before the battle took place, and that in the dream, their victory could only be facilitated if one of them died. When the battle did take place, it is believed that in order to guarantee their victory in accordance with the dream, Decius Mus charged into battle alone, and was therefore immediately struck down by the front lines of the Latin army. With this self-sacrifice, now seemingly ensuring that the battle would now be in Roman favour, Torquatus did not allow for it to go in vain, and led the entire army to capture and kill nearly three-fourths of the Latin army. It has since been interpreted that the dream both consuls saw was a sign from the gods, and that it was Decius Mus who volunteered his own life to the underworld gods also that his nation would be victorious in the conflict. Whilst it does sound like a total Roman victory, it is understood from Livy that Rome was not able to chase down the Latins who had fled from the battle, for they themselves had sustained heavy losses, possibly on the account of the chaos that ensued after Musa's sacrifice and Torquatus' inability to manage both divisions effectively in the wake of the consul's death. In the same year, the Battle of Trifanium was also fought, which did see Manlius Torquatus eventually pursue the fleeing Latins from Mount Vesuvius, where he met them at the mouth of the Liri River. The battle appeared to have been quite impromptu, with both sides suddenly ditching their baggage and re-engaging for part two of the earlier skirmish. Livy tells us that the Romans were of course victorious, but that Manlius Torquatus was so thorough in his decimation of the Latins 
that when he entered Latium in central western Italy, the Latins there immediately surrendered. A third and final battle took place in the year 338 BC near Pedum, an ancient town of Latium. Here, Rome went up against yet another coalition of armies from the surrounding Latin towns, who, in a last ditch attempt, went on the defense to repel Rome. While skirmishes had opened up all over Latium by the instigating Roman force, the Battle of Pedum would be the most notable, given the concentrated efforts by the Latin towns. It would see the forces of the towns from Tiber, Praeneste, Antium, Arcia, Lanuvium, and Velitre, as well as various Volsci tribes, attempt to congregate at Pedum to prepare for the Roman invasion. But newly elected consuls Gaius Manius and Lucius Furius Camillus were able to catch many of the military bodies on their way to the battle, and so were able to pick them off before they could surmount an organized defense. The combined efforts of the consuls saw them overcome the Latin coalition, and with the main battle out of the way, they took it upon themselves to quench the remaining military influence still held throughout Latium, and thus brought an end to the Latin War. With the undeniable Roman victory, the Latins had become the very subjects of Rome that they had originally contested against. They were forced to recognize Roman authority, and many towns were Romanized, where they adopted much of Roman culture while sacrificing their own. With the war over, the Latin League was entirely dissolved, and the might and reach of Rome was extended yet again. Now given some of the extraordinary things that had taken place during the Latin War, such as Manlius Torquatus executing his own son to make a point about obedience, or Decius Mus sacrificing himself in the battle because of a dream, you might be wondering how much of this is actually true. Well, the accounts in this episode have mostly come from Roman historian Livy, though these have since been scrutinized by modern historians as being a fanciful take on the actual events that might have happened those which frame Rome in a more glorious light. This is especially true when you consider that Livy was born long after the events of this battle, and that many of his sources were from historians who were also not alive during this time. With this, Livy's accounts are considered to be somewhat fictional, filled with dramatic tropes and ideas that kind of spice things up a little, and make the warriors involved usually the consuls themselves, look far more heroic and important than they actually might have been. But whether or not Livy's account is riddled with essences of make-believe or dramatizations, these wars were indeed recorded as having taken place, and Rome evidently was the grand victor in most of these conflicts, hence why they became the dominant powerhouse across the Italian peninsula and beyond. But let me know what you thought about today's episode on Ancient Roman History Explained, and as always, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.